Over the past two weeks, I've been speaking with Fleming College President Maureen Adamson about the challenges of preparing students for the fourth industrial revolution. It not only uh, gets to the hard technical skills, but certainly those social skills that are so important these days. And the challenges of achieving equity and diversity on campus. Uh, particularly as it relates to trades and technology, we need to debunk the theory that women don't want to go into trades and technology because it's dirty work. It's not. This week, we wrap up our conversation by looking at how higher ed leaders can encourage a culture of innovation on campus by ensuring we put our money where our mouths are. We've got to give the gift of time to the thinkers, the faculty, the front line in particular. This week, Maureen Adamson on investing in our people. Thanks for taking some time, Maureen. Thanks for being here. My pleasure. Are, are there things you've seen from your work in government and healthcare that leaders can leverage to encourage culture change on campus, to, to, to support innovators in transforming the ways we teach, the ways we support students. What can leaders do to nurture that culture of innovation on the campus? The most important, in my mind, to uh, be able to uh, create that kind of a culture of innovation is to give the gift of time. We've got to give the gift of time to the thinkers, the faculty, the front line in particular. It can't be someone in a back room trying to think something up. It, and we have to also invest in our people. We want our faculty to be best in class. That requires investment. That requires professional development. And that has to be a priority of Fleming, and it is. The more we can start to think outside of the box, talks like the one you delivered today, Ken was inspiring. There's a buzz in this college. And what you did, and what I think we need more of, is start to think beyond our navel, beyond our community, beyond our province, and see what others are doing. There's about a dozen ways in which institutions are responding. This extreme example of this kind of modularity comes from Arizona. In New Zealand, uh, one of my clients, ERA Institute, has a VR simulation they use to train radiology students. Nobody in North America seems to do more of this than Niagara College. There's a lot of fabulous stuff out there that is, uh, is mind-blowing. On the whole planet, there's probably no institution that has mobilized at scale student retention initiatives to the same degree as Georgia State University has. The, the latest and greatest example I've seen is in Australia at Deakin University, where they've created a tool called Genie. In times of cut, there will be no cuts to professional development at Fleming College. That is my commitment to, to this school. I would That's also putting your money where it, your mouth is, really, Maureen. That, that, that as an educational institution, we believe in education strongly enough that we're not cutting that budget line. Because it is a place where a lot of institutions cut. Yes. Uh, conference attendance goes down. Employees get less PD in many institutions because budgets are tight. Yeah. Uh, I think that's an important commitment to make. And there's no evidence to say that cutting PD is helpful. So <laughs> I would think there's probably evidence to the contrary. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So let's go with the evidence-based uh, answers to that. The other thing I would like to add, though, is that you asked the question about other industries that I've learned from. Mm. Certainly healthcare is one of them. When you think about healthcare and you think about things like we have at Fleming, applied research, or other kinds of research, research is something that mistakes are expected. They're not mm. penalized. And we have to give people the opportunity to take a risk and to make mistakes because they will happen. And that's the only way we're going to get to that point of innovation in my mind. I think that's really one of the big hurdles that, that academic culture generally for a thousand years has been about carefully researching, checking all your footnotes, peer review, making sure that anything you put out there is thoroughly checked and you're comfortable that it's unassailable. And then public sector culture is all about ensuring we're being responsible with tax dollars, we're accountable, that, that we're efficient, that, that there's no, no false starts. And, and so the compound of an acad a public academic institution is that in a lot of ways we've got that double whammy against the, the freedom to innovate, to take risks. And, and I think it's felt more intensely the further toward the front line you get in an institution, that presidents and vice presidents and even directors tend to feel strongly that some experimentation is, is, is a powerful thing and that we need to take some risks to 
of calculated risks and, and explore possibilities. But the further we get down the organizational chart, the, the more anxiety there is about CLMs, career limiting moves, mm. uh, about making an error that draws too much bad attention. Uh, and, and so I really am curious about ways in which we can, uh, you know, are there systemic ways, are there structural ways, are there policies we can create that help to ensure that uh, the frontline staff and faculty actually are protected from uh, the, the perceived threat that impedes innovation? Well, I think it's all about accountability and accountability frameworks that are productive, that allow frontline faculty to be creative, to make some mistakes. As you said, they're calculated, uh, measured risk, but that we all understand the individual accountability and the joint accountability, because these kinds of approaches are all hands on deck, and they're very iterative. In government, as a senior bureaucrat, as a deputy minister, I can tell you that bureaucracy is very risk averse. We are very fortunate at Fleming to be a few steps removed from that kind of bureaucracy, and we're fortunate to be a college where we have some latitude to change things up, and we have to shift the paradigm of where the power centers are. They need to be with faculty and in the classrooms and with the student experience. And I think what's, what I learned in bureaucracy is that even if people didn't want to hear what you had to say, you always must speak truth to power. It might not be an easy thing to do, but uh, it allows you to sleep at night. I think we covered it right hard. That sounded good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank You're you so fabulous. I appreciate it. Oh my God, we've got Look more to come. To the afternoon. Yes. We have a world of higher ed innovations and bright ideas to bring you in the weeks ahead. To be sure you don't miss a thing, take a moment now to subscribe. And thanks for watching. Okay, so let's see. There's one more point I would like oh, sure. to make. Absolutely. Somebody that last said, line was great. Yeah, that was a good way to end it. Yeah, that was a great line. <laughs> oh, Truth to power. I was thinking, I am such a coward. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know how to follow that line, but.